What's up, Ice and Fire fans? Welcome back to the House of Vine podcast and the conclusion to the Golden Lions, Golden Dragons series. You've been waiting patiently for me to wrap this topic up, so let's hop right into trying to find an answer to the question I've been saving for last. Is Tyrion the only child of Lord Tywin? Of the three Lannister children, Tyrion is said to be the most like Tywin. Both of them are extremely intelligent, decisive, and cunning. We even see that during his short reign as Hand of the King, Tyrion can be just as politically astute as his Lord Father. Okay, so what? Having similar characteristics doesn't prove Tywin actually sired the youngest Lannister child, right? It only implies that Tyrion learned more from Tywin than his siblings. That said, these similarities do lead us back to A Feast for Crows, Jaime Chapter 5, when Jenna Lannister speaks to her nephew. Remember, at first, we think she means this figuratively that Tyrion mirrors Tywin in terms of his actions and how well he handles problems. In that sense, yes, Tyrion is his father's son. However, like I said back in part one, I believe that Jenna meant this literally. I think this was Jenna's semi-subtle attempt at telling Jaime Tywin is not his real father. Don't forget, Tywin didn't speak to his sister for half a year after she said that to him. She even adds that men can be thundering great fools. We could say Tywin's foolishness revolved around him not wanting to agree with his sister that Tyrion is more like him than, say, Jaime. However, in my opinion, Tywin not speaking to his sister for six months seems a little dramatic, if that truly was the case. On the other hand, Tywin not speaking to Jenna after she tried telling him that the twins are not his children makes a little bit more sense. Now, I want to come straight out and say that I believe Tyrion is Lord Tywin's one and only child. Furthermore, I think it's highly probable that the great, powerful lord of Casterly Rock was actually sterile, or at the very least, didn't have all the ingredients to produce ideal Lannister children such as Jaime and Cersei. To explain how I arrived to this epiphany, we'll have to take a look at the House Lannister Under the Dragons portion of the World Book. I'll be focusing on four specific generations of Lannisters, starting with Tywin's grandfather, Gerald the Golden, and his older brother, Tybalt. Tybalt and Gerald were the only children of Lord Daemon Lannister and Sarissa Brax, Tybalt being the heir to Casterly Rock. Their father, whom people called the Grey Lion, fell victim to the Great Spring Sickness in 210 AC, raising his heir to Lord. However, Tybalt's reign over the Westerlands would be a short one, beginning in 210 and ending in 212. Let's listen to another one of Maester Yandel's history lessons to get a better look at these two Lannister brothers. Following the Grey Line's passing in 210 AC, his son Tybalt succeeded him as Lord of Casterly Rock, only to perish himself two years later under suspicious circumstances. A young man in his prime, Lord Tybalt left no heir of the body save for a daughter, Sorel, three years of age, whose reign as Lady of Casterly Rock proved cruelly short. In less than a year, she too was dead. Whereupon the Rock and the Westerlands and all the wealth and power of House Lannister passed to her uncle Gerald, the late Lord Tybalt's younger brother. So Yandel tells us that Lord Tybalt and his wife, Tiora Kindel, only ever had one child, a daughter named Sorella. Since Tybalt never produced a male heir, Sorella inherited all of her father's lands and titles until her death at the young age of three, whereupon Gerald took over as ruler of the West. If you notice, the text specifically tells us that Tybalt was a young man in his prime, yet he only ever fathered one child, and he left no male children behind. By itself, this piece of information holds no significance, though it does serve as our first sign of breadcrumbs. Now let's continue reading about Lord Gerald, his two wives, and his children. A genial man known to be exceedingly clever, Gerald had served as regent for his young niece, but the suddenness of her death at such a tender age set tongues to wagging, and it was whispered widely in the West that both Lady Sorrel and Tybalt had died at his hands. No man now living can say with certainty whether there was any truth to these whispers, for Gerald Lannister soon proved himself to be an exceptionally shrewd, able, and fair-minded lord, greatly increasing the wealth of House Lannister, the power of Castle Rock, and the trade at Lannisport. 
he ruled the Westlands for 31 years, earning the sobriquet Gerald the Golden. Yet the tragedies that befell House Lannister in the years that followed were proof enough for Lord Gerald's enemies. His beloved second wife, Lady Rowan, vanished under mysterious circumstances in 230 AC, less than a year after giving birth to his lordship's fourth and youngest son, Jason. We learn from Maester Yandel that Gerald's second wife, Rohan Weber, who you might remember from Duncan Eggs, The Soren Sword, mysteriously disappeared soon after giving birth to their fourth son, Jason Lannister, Lady Joanna's father. You know who also disappeared? In regards to Yandel's history lesson, that is? Gerald's first wife, Alisanne Farman. The only place we see her name is in the Lannister family tree. It is possible that she died, but since it is not mentioned specifically in the Lannister family tree, it's safe to assume that Gerald remarried after Lady Alisanne failed to produce him an heir. Considering Lady Rowan gave Gerald four children, all of which were boys, we're led to surmise that Alisanne was the problem, not Lord Gerald. This is where we find our second trace of breadcrumbs, and here's my reasoning. In the Great Joys of Pike section of World, which, by the way, precedes the Westerlands section, so this should be fresh in your mind, we're told of how Dalton Greyjoy, the Red Kraken, captured Fair Isle during the dance. Dalton took four of Lord Farman's daughters as salt wives and gave the fifth daughter to his brother. The Red Kraken died without ever siring any trueborn children, but had many with his salt wives. Since four out of however many salt wives he did have were Farman's, the likelihood of Dalton's children coming from these Farman women is extremely high. This forces me to question whether Lady Alison was truly to blame for not producing Gerald an heir. Later on, we're going to go over an event similar to the Gerald slash Alison issue, which will help reinforce this particular theory. But before we move on, there is a small piece of information that helps keep this Alison issue afloat. Does anyone recall Jane Farman? Well, if you do, that's a nice and fire point to you because I sure as hell didn't. To those of you who don't, let me fill you in. Jane was the childhood friend of Cersei who accompanied her and Malera Heatherspoon to visit Maggie the Frog. Jane was the timid one of the three girls who ran out of the tent screaming after they woke the Woods Witch. It's during Cersei's dream that we learn that Jane still lives on Fair Isle, is married, and has whelped a dozen children. So, do you still think that Alisanne couldn't have children? Because other women from the same house might disagree. Moving on, let's get back to Gerald, his second wife, and the next generation of Lannisters that I want to discuss. Mr. Yandel, if you would be so kind. Tywald, the eldest of his twin sons, died in battle in 233 AC while squaring for Lord Robert Rain of Castamere during the Peak Uprising. Less well known, but no less baleful, are the dire effects the battle had upon the history of the West. Tywell Lannister had long been betrothed to the Red Lion's spirited young sister, Lady Ellen. This strong-willed and hot-tempered maiden, who had for years anticipated becoming the Lady of Castle Rock, was unwilling to forsake that dream. In the aftermath of her betrothed death, she persuaded his twin brother, Tion, to set aside his own betrothal to a daughter of Lord Rowan of Golden Grove and espouse her instead. Lord Gerald, it is said, opposed this match, but grief and age and illness had left him a pale shadow of his former self, and in the end, he gave way. In 235 AC, in a double wedding at Castle Rock, Sir Tion Lannister took Ellen Rain to wife, whilst his younger brother Titus wed Jane Marbrand, a daughter of Lord Alan Marbrand of Ashmark. Twice a widower and ailing, Lord Gerald did not wed again. So after her marriage, Ellen of House Rain became the Lady of Castle Rock in all but name. As her good father retreated to his books and his bedchamber, Lady Ellen held a splendid court, staging a series of magnificent tourneys and balls, and filling the rock with artists, mummers, musicians, and reigns. Her brothers, Roger and Reynard, were ever at her side, 
and officers, honors, and lands were showered upon them, and upon her uncles, cousins, and nephews, and nieces as well. Lord Gerald's aged fool, an acerbic hunchback called Lord Toad, was heard to say, Lady Ellen must surely be a sorceress, for she has made it rain inside the rock all year. In 236 AC, the pretender Damon Blackfire, third of his name, crossed the narrow sea and landed upon Massey's Hook with bitter steel and the Golden Company, intent on taking the Iron Throne. King Aegon V summoned leal lords from all across the Seven Kingdoms to oppose him, and the Fourth Blackfire Rebellion began. It ended far more quickly than the pretender might have wished at the Battle of Wendwater Bridge. Afterward, the corpses of the Black Dragon slain choked the Wendwater and sent it overflowing its banks. The Royalists, in turn, lost fewer than a hundred men, but amongst them was Sir Tian Lannister, heir to Castle Rock. So the four sons of Gerald and Rowan were the twins Tywald and Tion, then Tytos, then Jason. According to the age calculation on the Ice and Fire wiki, the twins were born sometime between 211 and 219 AC. Now, we have no idea whether Tywald and Tion were identical twins or fraternal, since there is no description of either of them in the world book. However, according to the U.S. National Library of Medicine, and I'm definitely paraphrasing here, having fraternal twins is hereditary, while identical twins are more of a look-of-the-draw type situation. Now yes, we have no idea how genetics work in this world. Putting that aside, Jamie and Cersei are fraternal twins, so this twin gene might have been passed down to them from Joanna's father, Jason, who are Tywald and Tion's youngest brother. We'll discuss this more later. We're told Tywald dies before wedding Lady Ellen Rain. However, Tion does marry her in 235 AC in a double wedding with his younger brother Tytos and a lady of House Marbrand. Sadly though, in the following year, Tion goes off and gets himself killed. Oh look, more breadcrumbs. Tion dies without ever fathering children. There is no way that a newly wedded man would go off to war without trying to make some kids. Lady Ellen wasn't prego when he died. This is starting to give us an idea of where this trail of breadcrumbs is leading us. Maybe Tion couldn't have children. Well, more likely it was that he didn't have enough time. There seems to be a growing pattern in which Lannister men take a while to finally father Lannister boys. Now let's talk about the timing in which these children were born. We already know that Tywald Lannister was the first born along with his twin, Tion. As of 211, Rowan is not married to Gerald. However, it is possible that Rowan marries Gerald in that year, meaning, technically, 211 AC is the first possible year for the twins' birth. That said, they were probably born somewhere in between. Titus was born in 220, with Jason born nine years later. So I'm thinking the twins were born earliest 213, 214 AC. Okay, so let's stop for a second, listen to another passage, then we can continue discussing Lady Ellen, Titus, and his wife, Jane Marbrand. The loss of the second of his glorious twins might well have been expected to break their grieving father, Lord Gerald. But curiously, the opposite seemed to be the case. As Satyan's body was laid to rest within Castle Rock, Gerald the Golden roused himself and took firm hold of the Westerlands once more, intent on doing all he could to prepare his third-born son, the weak-willed and unpromising boy, Titus, to succeed him. The reign of the reigns was at an end. Lady Ellen's brother soon departed Castle Rock for Castamere, accompanied by many of the other reigns. Lady Ellen remained, but her influence dwindled while that of Lady Jane grew. Soon the rivalry between Sir Tian's widow and Titus's wife became truly ugly, if the rumor set down by Maester Belden can be believed. Belden tells us that in 239 AC, Ellen Rain was accused of bedding Titus Lannister, urging him to set aside his wife 
and marry her instead. However, young Titus, then 19, found his brother's widow so intimidating that he was unable to perform. Humiliated, he ran back to his wife to confess and beg her forgiveness. Lady Jane was willing to pardon her young husband, but was less forgiving of her good sister, and did not hesitate to inform Lord Gerald of the incident. Furious, his lordship resolved to rid Castle Rock of Ellen Rain for good and all by finding her a new husband. Ravens flew, and a hasty match was made. Within the fortnight, Ellen Rain was wed to Waldron Tarbuck, Lord of Tarbuck Hall, the florid, 55-year-old widowed lord of an ancient, honorable, but impoverished house. Ellen Rain, now Lady Tarbuck, departed Castle Rock with her husband never to return. But the rivalry between her and Lady Jane was not at an end. If anything, it seemed to intensify through what Lord Toad came to call the War of the Wounds. Though Lady Ellen had not been able to give Sir Tian an heir, she proved more fertile with Waldron Tarbuck, who, it should be noted, had a number of older sons from his first two marriages. With both of Titus's older brothers dead, he would become the next Lord of Casterly Rock upon his father's death. Lord Gerald had been out of the ruling game for some time, but after putting his second son to rest, he came back into the fold so he could prepare Titus for the position. When Tion was alive, Lady Ellen held a lot of sway within their borders. After her husband's death, she remained at the rock, but her influence dwindled. Then we get this story of how she tried to seduce Titus, but Titus just couldn't get it up because she was too intimidating. Then he goes and runs off and tells his wife and begs for forgiveness. Lady Jane does forgive him, but she demands Lady Ellen be sent away. Ellen then gets remarried to some old-ass lord and immediately gives birth to a child. Then the text specifically tells us he had a number of other sons from a previous marriage, meaning there wasn't a rush to have more children with Lady Ellen, let alone three. This takes us back to her marriage with Tion and their lack of children. I'm really starting to think that certain Lannister men have a few issues in the reproduction department. Also, this semi-love affair involving Ellen, Titus, and Jane is very similar to the one involving Ares, Rhaella, and Joanna. The king and Joanna are caught, his sister wife forgives him, but demands Joanna be sent away. Alright, so we're at the halfway point, let's move on. We get to the next generation, the children of Titus and Jason. Titus was 15 when he married Jane Marbrand. By this point in time, the Lannister numbers are pretty low. Not to mention that Jason is only six at this time. Titus did father a very hefty brood. It is very strange that he waited seven years to get those Lannister numbers back up. Titus was two and twenty when Tywin was born, in the year 242 AC. Then his siblings are born. Kevin in 244, followed by a girl, Jenna, in 245. Then five years later, they have another boy named Tyget. Then finally, Garion in 255 AC, resulting in Lady Jane's death. Now, this definitely raises a few questions regarding Tywin and Garion as compared with Joanna's death following Tyrion. If Tywin resented Tyrion as much as he did, holding him responsible for Joanna's death, wanting to kill him as a baby, as well as subjecting him to horrific acts of sexual violence, you know, the whole Tysha incident, it's strange that Tywin places no blame on Garion for killing his mother. He doesn't even show a fraction of that kind of cruelty to his little brother. Sorry, I'm getting a little sidetracked. Anyway, let's move on to Jason and his children. It doesn't seem Jason had a problem fathering children, but there are a few breadcrumbs involving them. Before getting married, Jason fathered a bastard with a serving girl who they named Lenora Hill. In later years, Sir Jason would go on to have true-born children with two different wives a boy and a girl with his first wife, Ally Staxpear, later marrying Marla Prester. Okay, so this takes us back to the whole fraternal twins issue surrounding Tywald and Tion and Jaime and Cersei. With Marla, Jason fathered six children, but only two of them survived, Joanna and Stefford. Look closely at what the Lannister family tree says. The four children that died were two male, then two female. I have a pretty strong feeling that these children were two sets of twins. 
This might actually be our one and only clue, suggesting Tywald and Tion were fraternal twins, not identical. I say this because Jason was a son of Gerald and Rowan. This twin gene could have been passed to Titus and Jason. Since we're told Jason had two sets of twins that died, I think it's a clue left by Martin telling us Jason passed the gene to Joanna since she herself gave birth to twins. Meanwhile, Titus fathered five children, and since none of them are twins, to me, it seems less likely this gene was passed to Tywin and Tywin fathering the twins, which also serves as more evidence that they are the Mad King's children. It's definitely something to consider. Now at last, we come to the last generation of our discussion, the children of Tywin and Joanna. My past videos have gone over at length how I believe the twins are actually the Mad King's and Joanna's. We also briefly discussed the years in which the twins and Tyrion were born, how inconsistent it is with Tywin's views on furthering the Lannister name, considering it was three years after they were married that the twins were born, and Tyrion seven years after that. When paired to the reoccurring gaps we see in boys being fathered by Lannister men, followed by mothers dying or disappearing after giving birth to that last boy, it overwhelmingly hints that there's just something wrong with the Lannister male genes, doesn't it? Which finally brings us to Tyrion. If the twins are not Tywins, then it took 10 years for Tywin to finally father a child. Tyrion might be an ugly little dwarf now, but he was just a normal baby when he was born. His head was a little bit bigger, yes, and maybe his legs and arms a little stunted, but he was still a normal boy. When Joanna dies after child labor, readers just assume it's just because he's a dwarf mixed into the fact that it's a medieval society and women die all the time in childbirth. However, with such a ridiculous amount of clues, albeit literary or actual clues existing in this world, it's quite possible Tywin's DNA, mixing with his own first cousin's DNA, after once carrying twins belonging to a man spawned from countless generations of incest, was actually the root cause of her death. Having to push out a semi-oversized baby was more of a nail in the coffin. She probably would have died whether Tyrion was born stunted or not, supported by previous generations. Oh, there's also two other random facts that I want to throw out there, and you can take them as you will. But there once was a Thailand Lannister who was master of coin for Aegon II. When Rhaenyra took King's Landing, she had him gelded when he refused to tell them where the gold was. And you know how Tywin's grandfather died? A bladder infection. I mean, come on people, it's all there. All the clues suggesting everything I'm trying to say in this theory. Okay, so yes, there are plenty of holes through all of this. But you know how I'm sure Tyrion is Tywin's only son? Because it makes for an amazing story. Not just for Tyrion, but for the twins as well. Cersei, the woman who curses the gods for not being born a man, believing to be the only one who truly mirrors her father. And she does mirror her father, because, like her father, Ares II, she's mad, cruel, extremely paranoid, and gets turned on by fire. Then Jaime, the knight sworn to protect his king, commanded to murder his own father, then actually killing his own father by putting a sword through his back. And Tyrion, the dwarf son, hated by his father, the man who refused to name him as his heir, never treating him like a true-born son, telling him, you are no son of mine, but... That is where you're wrong, father. Why, I believe I'm you, Rich Small. Do me a kindness now, and die quickly. I have a ship to catch. For once his father did what Tyrion asked him. The proof was the sudden stench, as his bowels loosened in the moment of death. Well, he was in the right place for it, Tyrion thought. But the stink that filled the privy gave ample evidence that the oft-repeated jape about his father was just another lie. Lord Tywin Lannister did not, in the end, shit gold. And that is why I believe Tyrion is the Golden Lion and Jaime and Cersei the Golden Dragons. So there we have it, folks. Seven Hells. This fan theory was a bitch. There's so much material to consider. But now that the series is finished, what do you think? Let me know in the comments below. Go ahead and pick holes through this theory and let me know what I left out or what I should reconsider. Oh, and as for what I got coming up next, 
I haven't forgotten about the Euron Greyjoy biography, plus I'm going to wrap up the Kevin Lannister breakdown followed by a new breakdown series. It will either be Catelyn 5, A Storm of Swords, or Bran 3, A Game of Thrones. Catelyn's chapter involves Rob naming his heir before the Red Wedding. Bran's is the chapter after his fall, his first dream with the Three-Eyed Crow. Thanks for watching, and as always, share, like, and subscribe to stay updated and be the first to watch newly uploaded videos.